Hearken to the drums of the Beltane fire, pounding out its rhythm as the flames leap higher. Dancing around it, your senses overcome, moving with abandon in time with the drum. You start to chant the ancient rhyme, calling to your lover, come to me, be mine. Come lie with me in the wildwood tonight, in honour of the ancients, let us unite. Welcome to another episode of A Pair of Banshees. Episode three. It's a band at Bialta now, my friends. And um, because this Friday, well, when we're recording this, it's it's Wednesday slash Thursday. Um, but when you'll be listening to this, we'll be on Friday, the first of May, which is Bialtana. So that's that's what this episode will be about. All the bands to be had at the Bialtana of the times. Can we just note that you said this is Wednesday slash Thursday? It was. <laughs> We're in the freaking middle of the night. You would think, being a quarantine, we would have all this time to do whatever we wanted and to record at a reasonable hour. But no, myself and Jenny decide to record in the middle of the night. It's it's 3.51 a.m. This has been happening to th- the last two times for us. We're just like, ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll, we'll call in the evening. And it just ends up like a, a delaying till this time. And um, but we've been talking since like midnight. We have a lot to say. But anyway, this is Bants at Bialtana, right? This this mad little episode is uh all about the lovely first of May, May Day, May Day, May Day, it's the first of May. So thank you again before we continue on with the episode to everybody who has been listening to us. Apparently there's somebody out in Spain and the US and the UK. So thank you so much to all of you out there actually listening to our voices on all the platforms and for following us on all the social medias. Yes, come find us. Come say boo. You'll find us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. We have an email. So whatever is your preferred method of contacting us, come say hey. Yeah, come say boo even, you know. Sorry, I ruined it. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> if you have any stories in your family that you would like to share, or any experiences of a paranormal, folklore, whatever, write them into us, and you never know. They may get read out in an episode. If yeah. you want. Yeah, so find us at pair of banshees everywhere and on all the social medias is what i mean and you can email us at pair of banshees at gmail.com mm-hmm. that's pretty good also um we have a fairy tree challenge so hashtag fairy tree challenge so what we're trying to do is create photographic evidence of fairy trees that are still in existence around the country because we want to show that this practice is still um, happening that people are not cutting down their fairy trees for whatever reasons yeah. that they're still growing in fields growing in walls so if there is a fairy tree um out and about when you're going on your 2k walk um take a photograph of it send it in to us um the the goal is that at the end of the year we'll have this huge collection of photographs of fairy trees from all over ireland and we'll be able to send them into the folklore archives in ucd i we'd love to do that because myself and Jenny are baby um, folklore scholars. Oh yeah, yeah, clearly, yeah. Well, we did. We we studied folklore in college for a period of time, so I think we're allowed to. to we to did. See. It was great to be fair. No, the the UCD folklore department is lovely and fantastic, and it was a great addition to my my three years. So mm, highly recommend taking folklore if you are thinking of going to college. Yes, absolutely. So, Sarah, mm? we start into a all the bants that you can be having at Bialtana and what this is that we're actually ghost waffling about. Absolutely. You're like, what is bants? What is Bialtana? What are these actually waffling about? So Bialtana, and I mean, this is another thing. Us saying this is probably a whole thing in itself because, I mean, 
as you know an Irish person, as an, an Irish Russian person, us having actually done Irish as a language in, in for twelve years, you know, in in secondary and primary school, but not being fluent. But not being fluent, of course, is the tradition. Yep. Um, <laughs> so that is the way I know how to say this word is because Bialtana in in Irish actually is the month of May. But in the States and other places, it, they say Beltane or Belton, different kind of variations of that. It's wrong. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes, the, the core inside of me wants to say, well, it's wrong because it's Bialtana. I know, I'm being ignorant. Of course, you can say it whatever the way you want to say it. Let me tell you a little bit about Bialtana. Well, I mean, when I was researching as well, it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly, like, what does it, exactly what it means or exactly where does the name come from? Because there's, there's different kind of sources, different kind of pagan religions will tell you their own kind of story. Um, the first mention of it that I found was in a 10th century glossary written by the King of Munster. And this glossary was translated in the 19th century by John O'Donovan, and he wrote that Bill Tinna is lucky fire, or two fires, which druids used to make uh, with great incantations, and they used to bring the cattle as a safeguard against the diseases each year through those fires. And that's from the 10th century, uh, and they think, you know, this this festival kind of originated in Ireland because these practices seem to come from Ireland. I have um, a Wiccan Bible by Anne-Marie Gallagher, and she just states that the name comes from Bel Tine, which is lucky or bright fire, and that the name comes from some gods, which is like from Bel or Belenus, from our Celtic ancestors, and that just means, yeah, like bright one uh, or bright fire, and that's why the festival mainly revolves around fire and different kind of variations like that. Something many people don't realise about Bjartana, uh, and it's a shame in a way, is we know the veil between our world and the other world gets quite thin around Halloween, but it also gets very thin around Bjartana as well. Bjartana is on the exact polar opposite of the calendar to Samhain. So at both ends of the year, we have the veil thinning. Whereas the veil is not thinning in Bjartana with the dead, but it's thinning with the fairies. So we have this quite trepidation of danger that <laughs> is kind of underlying beneath the surface that we don't realise. Um, and we have many customs to tell you about that were in practice. And that still are in practice in some places to protect homes and livestock against fairy charms and curses at this time. Yeah, so from our research, you said, Sarah, that you found mostly uh, references in folklore about protection against the fairies. Whereas yes. yeah. me, I because I'm, I'm witchy, <laughs> mm-hmm. I try to go into my witchy books and I kind of searched it from a pagan witchcraft kind of aspect. Mm. It's a more kind of positive way of looking at this festival, whereas in folklore there is that kind of fear of fear of the fairies and protection as the main theme, whereas in the kind of more pagan sense of Bialtana, it's all about joy and rebirth and fertility. And then we should also compare that it, in Catholicism, uh, which came in and just like wipes the floor with all these old ancient traditions, it established itself as the month of Mary. May became the maiden month. Mm-hmm. And people began to make May altars. They made, um, they said the rosary every night. Suddenly all of this kind of pagan old Irish um, tradition started to kind of blur into this kind of weird thing that Irish society I think is made of. It's like half Catholic and half pagan. You know, like we blur a lot of our things together. Which is interesting. Like, I mean, who's to say the two can't coexist? So the folkloric aspect that is negative, again, it's about the fairies. Because the veil is quite thin, there is a fear of the fairies coming into your home, the fairies coming in and stealing your livestock. There was a particular concern around um, 
cattle at this time because cattle and farming was obviously a main part of the economy but also in a family's own diet they probably like consumed an awful lot of like either meat dairy butter because a lot of families in rural Ireland would have owned farms so there was this fear that if anything happened to your cattle you lost out on money and you possibly lost out on health and you lost out on food so there was all these concerns it, it did have a positive aspect, like particularly around the building of the May bush, which we'll t- tell you about later on. It would become quite a big festive occasion because it was seen as the first day of summer. The neighbours and everyone would gather together and it was seen as like the first day after winter when people could get together and celebrate. So it was like you were seeing faces that you hadn't seen in ages which is quite sad in a way that we're in quarantine. And I know, right? You know, the irony that Biauten is about bringing people together to celebrate the long days ahead, and we can't at the moment. Unfortunately, but, you know, but what does it mean we can't kind of embrace the positive aspects of this? Or I'll give you some things to maybe practice or do yourself later on as well. Real, yeah, real sense of community, even if it was that kind of... Uh, run by that fear of what the fairies would do or that kind of fear of um the kylock coming in like a hag yeah. coming into your home or taking your milk and your butter <laughs> yes. you know even though there was that there was always dancing merriment joy celebration like it's first day of bloody summer you know the sun is out everything's blooming uh days are longer you know and apparently you can predict the weather that you're going to have all summer by how the weather is on the 1st of May. Mm. And this is what's interesting, Jenny, right? If there is a east wind blowing over the country, it is said to be a bad wind, an unhealthy wind, and to bring flus. Oh. Coronavirus! <laughs> Coronavirus! <laughs> oh, no. Ah, so we all have to go stand outside, lick our fingers, and, like, hold it up to the wind and be like, where are you coming from? <laughs> if it's from the east, does that mean all of summer will be postponed? Like, we'll be in lockdown throughout all of summer? Is that what that would mean? I don't know, but apparently the... I don't know. Apparently it was an unhealthy wind, but sure, isn't that the thing? If we get an east wind, it's supposed to be a, a dry wind. I thought we all wanted east winds. We don't want Atlantic winds. But the Wicked Witch of the East comes from the east, so I don't know. Never wanted the East. We're, we're dealing with what we have right now, right? We're going we're gonna to make this positive. It's going to be a positive episode, and Friday will be bloody positive. <laughs> okay? Yes. Yeah. me? Do you all hear me? I hear you. I accept that. Okay. Jenny, tell me. Biafana around the world. Is, it, is there other traditions? Is there other cultures that celebrate something on the 1st of May? Is Absolutely. it a strictly Irish thing? It's not a strictly Irish thing, even though it... It seems to have all come from Ireland and then the kind of British Isles, like Scotland and a bit a bit of England, you know. Mostly yeah. Scotland and Ireland that all these kind of traditions stem from, um, which is lovely. Like, it's nice to know that. Yes, it's so the Celticness is, is real with this one. Yeah. I mean, May Day is such a common idea, right? Like, you think of... You think May Day, you think summer, you think the Maypole, you know, that's very, the, the images that kind of spring to mind and everybody kind of knows that without necessarily knowing anything actually about it, right? Yeah. So I think it's kind of, it's rooted in our subconscious. Yes, with the dancing and the singing and like old medieval music of a lyre. Yeah, I hear Absolutely. all that. Absolutely. That is what I'm here for. So May Day celebrations in Scotland obviously were a very big thing, often celebrated though on May 2nd, not the 1st. Um, and they did, yeah, lots of bonfires to drive away witches and supernatural forces, though. Not um, like in Ireland, where the bonfires were a sort of purification for cattle and yourself um, and a kind of blessing. They kind of, I guess, in the way that you ward off fairies here in Ireland, in Scotland, mm-hmm. they wanted to ward off witches and supernatural forces. Is that because witchcraft as a whole was a much more feared thing in Britain? I would say so. Mm, That's interesting. Because we have, I guess, yeah, you think of Ireland, you think of, yeah, that kind of a local healer uh, or fairy doctor or something, and it wasn't a a thing to be feared. It was part of the community. Whereas in Britain, it was, you know, yeah, it was was a very... Devil worshipper. Yeah, it was a very real fear. It wasn't a good thing, you know? 
And so, yeah, so they seem to have burned bonfires to keep away bad things. And people ran through towns and villages with flaming sticks and pitchforks. Maybe that's where that kind of image comes from. And apparently they did shout things like, burn the witch. In Germany, they have, um, I'm I'm so sorry for my pronunciation, Walpurgis night, Walpurgis nacht, um, or Hexennacht is a thing that happens there. So it's the night before the feast day of Saint Walpurga who Mm. battle witches in life and therefore they're kind of they have this saint day where they celebrate this person who fought and battled witches apparently Mm -hmm. um and then it's sometimes called hexenacht um and that's thought to be a night when witches would gather to celebrate the start of spring right yeah so i went i went to germany in england and around the uk it's very known to have um like may day and they would crown a may king may queen um so it was this kind of kind of carnivalesque idea of like misrule um which is very like pagan i guess a day where you're allowed to kind of make fun of institutions and rules and society and just crown uh maybe a poor kind of peasant as a may queen you know for the day that kind of thing i mean the idea of um printing the may bush is very like Irish, but that I found um, cases of that in the UK, um, especially uh, kind of found amongst, as they call like the Gaelic diaspora, especially in places like Newfoundland, right. and places on the east coast of the United States, mm. um, you know, where people would have emigrated to, emigrated to, yeah, and brought kind of traditions with them. And a very big tradition that relates to it's kind of died out unfortunately i had the pleasure of actually seeing some of this when i was in nottingham um last time which was what in like march at the very start of march or something um we accidentally we were going around the nottingham castle which is locked right now even before quarantine um and there were a few folk groups doing some morris dancing which is a thing that comes up when you think about this Bialtana kind of May Day celebrations. It was very famous to do this kind of traditional folk kind of dance, which is called Morris dancing. It dates back all the way to like 1450s. Um, And the kind of the earliest references involve kind of courtly settings where these kind of, it's like Kaylee dancing, where you kind of have specific structure and specific choreography that's repeated throughout, you know, Mm -hmm. that everybody does. Uh, And usually they wear bells around their feet and their hands and their costumes are very colourful. It looks super pagan, even though it's not. What's the music like? It's it's usually played on a flute or an accordion. It's like, it's very folky. It's very folk medieval style kind of music, you know? It's really lovely. And they just do these kind of traditional dances with these bells on them. And uh, different kind of folk groups have different kind of costumes and a different kind of style. Like one group might dance with sticks. One group does just like jumps with the bells on their feet. Um, one does kind of dance maybe with sticks uh, that they kind of spin around and dance with. And apparently it was a favorite of uh, both King Henry the Seventh and the Eighth. And obviously when many things are popular with the rich, they become popular with the common folk as well. Yeah. So by 1541, it was so popular, it began to be like criticized by the church and the church even denounced it as a vice and called it devilish. <laughs> and I found a little fact saying that more than 10,000 bells were imported into London during uh, 1567 and 68, all for teams of Morris dancers. This is what happens when a trend starts in many right? times. And it was so popular and like done so much that yeah, the church was like, nope, no more of this. It just gets a notion the church does and like, bam. Oh, what's that quote? Um, the SpongeBob quote. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> ah. What do you mean? What, what's SpongeBob quote? Do you know the SpongeBob, the Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy? Oh, Jesus. Like, evil. Evil. Yeah, that. We do a great impression. <laughs> I know we do. Yeah. But let me also throw in there before I forget and get distracted. Uh, it's something that my parents then said. They're like, oh, yeah, May the 1st. Like, it's actually Labor Day or Day of the Workers in the Soviet Union. It's known as, like, in um, 1918, 
May the 1st became a public holiday known as the Day of the International Solidarity of Workers. So it's Workers' Day or Labor Day where most cities uh, had like parades and uh, workers' marches until 1990, until like the Soviet Union fell apart. Wow, that's interesting that it wasn't um, coming from a folklore uh, tradition. It wasn't. It was feminist. My dad said it kind of started in feminist roots where, you know, women workers wanted to have a way to kind of celebrate themselves and to have marches and parades and things like that. So it became this day of solidarity for everybody who works. Wow. Which has nothing to do with yeah, anything pagan or anything like that, but it's just... No. That's how the Russians would know May the 1st, anyway. But also, we have a very, very big tradition of, like, in Ireland, regarding May 1st, which is Ishnak. Before I go into what Ishnak is, I have to give you a little bit of context to the Celtic god and goddesses, some of the focal ones that are around this point. Um, and I think, like, my childhood was wasted studying Egyptian gods and goddesses because I was I was an Egyptian freak and I was too I was very interested in that stuff but I'm like when I go back and like read into Celtic mythology I'm like why aren't we learning this in school this stuff is fascinating I think we need to do a whole episode on like Celtic mythology at some point it's oh I think so but anyway so what it comes from is the two of the Danon is a supernatural race that came to the shores of Ireland. And these are supposed to be the deities of pre-Christian Ireland. So they dwell in the other world, but they interact with the human world quite often. And the two that I kind of want to talk about that have primary focus in Ishnak, the first one is Eru. And I think this is class. Okay, listen to this, right? Eru is where the name Erin, Ireland, comes from. Okay. So Ireland was named after a goddess. I love that. Isn't that amazing? Because obviously Ireland in Irish is Erin. Erin, yeah. Eru. Ah. Isn't that amazing? I just felt... And she was the goddess of Ireland. Um, so she, along with her sisters, Bonba, I'm going to butcher this, Fjoldia, Fjold, Folda, Foldla. You tried. I tried. Were interpreted as goddesses of sovereignty. Okay. So they were all members of the two of the Danon. And then you had Lou. And Lou is like a very well-known member of, of this um, of group of people. He's portrayed as a warrior, a king, a master craftsman, and a savior. He's associated with truth, law, and oats. Nice. We like oats. Um, he's associated with the harvest. So August in Irish is Lunasa, which obviously comes from Lu. So that's why he's connected to that. And to give you a bit of context as to who he was, his son is Cucullin. Oh. Now, this gives you a bit of a timeline. But Lu was killed in a revenge attack by the sons of a man he killed because one of his wives was sleeping with him. Of course. As, as you do. Oh, God, drama, yeah. But Lou is very much associated with battles and everything like that. And when I was reading up about all this, I could just see it in a movie. So if anyone out there is making a movie about Celtic gods and goddesses, I well, they should. I want to be part of it. I hope you are, Sarah. I'd love that. Oh, we ha- it's just incredible when you go back and read it because this stuff you never see this stuff like no, you learn about say the children of Lear and you learn about maybe the salmon of knowledge and all that this is what I want to know about though but like this you know you go back to the supernatural race who like you have founded so much of like Irish kind of identity like Lou is said to have invented fickle you know like chess yeah yeah he's supposed to have invented the Irish version version of chess and then County Loud is obviously Lou in Irish is named after him. Wow. I mean, the fact that we didn't know Ireland is named after a goddess. That's shocking. I'm disgusted with myself. Erasure of women. Again. See, again. Again. Yes. And there is the banshee. Goddesses. Ishnak is a hill uh, found halfway between Athlone and Mullingar. And I'm kicking myself because it's about an hour away from me. And never in my life have I wanted to visit this hill more than <laughs> when I can't. So 
It is located about 590 feet above sea level and at its summit you can see 20 counties. It wow. is known as the navel of Ireland. Its roots lie beyond recorded history. There is evidence of Neolithic, Bronze Age and medieval civilization happening there. So the activity spans 5000 years just wow. on this site alone. So it is supposed to be the burial place of Eru and Lu. This is where these gods and goddesses come into it. It is seen as sacred ground and it is said that all the four provinces, so Ulster, Munster, Leinster, Connacht, were supposed to meet here. And this was also the gateway into the, the fifth province, which was where the two of the Danon were a part of. I see. Okay, so this is making sense. So this is where it was also where the high kings of ireland would sit before tara and they would come and meet at ishnok and they would decide on the rules of all the provinces so how you access the fifth province was under the stone of divisions which is a sacred fragmented boulder of limestone that is on the southwest slope so it's six meters and it's 30 tons wow. Sorry. Um, it symbolizes Ireland united through its divisions, but it's mostly known as the cat stone because it is shaped like a cat watching a mouse. And it is said that Eru is buried beneath it. Oh, wow. Yep. When the high kings came to Ishnok, they would have to get married, uh, quote unquote, to Eru as part of the ceremony of taking the throne of Ireland. So Ishnok divided Ireland and how it divided it was knowledge in the west, battle in the north, prosperity in the east and music in the south and then royalty in the center which if you think about it is kind of like prosperity in the east you have like dublin you know you have all the big there the north you had like so the troubles the and troubles you had the west with knowledge you had like so many scholars and everything come from the west the south with music now i don't know about that one very much but like i'm trusting there was some music happening down there <laughs> I mean, it's Ireland. There's always music happening. It's just interesting. Bar like the imprints of the, the ring forge, the cat stone, there's nothing physical left on the landscape except the kind of engravements into the ground as to where uh, there's evidence of structures being built. So when you go there, it is a big hill. There's nothing like you can go into or just visit. It's not like you're going to go there and see a castle. But spiritually it hosts um a huge amount of power i mean it would it's it's the navel <laughs> exactly so well, this is coins from ancient afghanistan have been found there coins yeah from ancient afghanistan and it shows it was an important place of assembly so you had loads of probably nationalities coming here at some point maybe you can imagine like almost a kind of game of thrones kind of wow yeah experience but the hilltop lake is where Lou is said to be buried. That's where his resting place is supposed to be. But St. Patrick, here we go, here's the Catholicism coming in, or Christianity at that point. Um, St. Patrick visited in the 5th century and wanted to build a church. Okay. He was opposed by the O'Neill clan, who were rulers of Ulster at the time, and he put a curse on the stones of Ishnach. Oh, for God's sake, Patrick. I know. But there was a, a well named after him, a holy well, so hopefully he was okay there. But then in the 12th century, in the year 1111, mm -hmm. okay, it was the meeting place where a whole lot of bishops came and divided Ireland up into the diocese that it is now. Great. So we have not changed our diocese since the year 1111. Wow. Okay. Isn't it? So it became like a place of massive pagan worship into somewhere where the Catholic Church split up the place. Yeah. And also De Valera, Daniel O'Connell, Padre Pierce, they all um, addressed mass crowds here. It was a meeting place. Joyce and Heaney used to go and visit this place for reflection and for inspiration. Um, it was, it's been a huge important point in Irish history. What is it your connection with Ishnok and Beowth and I hear you asking? Well, let me tell you. Okay. There is one, right? <laughs> I think I think it is um it's a beautiful one. So firstly what happened was on May Eve, all the fires across Ireland were extinguished in the hearth of the house. 
The fire is known as being very much a focal point. It provided heat, obviously, and warmth. It was a place of cooking. It was a place where people would gather together and talk and chat. And it was it's seen as the center of the cottage. It's like so the heart of the house, yeah. Yes, exactly. And so to extinguish it was a pretty big deal. It wasn't really allowed to go out at most times. But now it is. The reason is, just before dawn on May Day, a fire would be lit on the hill of Ishnach. And it would be this roaring, great, huge, spectacular fire. And when this fire got so high and so big that it could be seen from far and wide, fires on other hills of uh, importance would be lit. So gradually you would have this like chain of fires being lit all over the country. When you would spot a fire in the distance, it meant you could light yours. And then you could light the fire in your own homes because it was bad luck. Otherwise, if your smoke left the chimney before the fire of Biautana, you were driving out the look of the house with that smoke. So can you can imagine how in the night time, and this is all going back to liminality again, and I think like liminality is when you're on the threshold of something. So for anyone that maybe is not familiar with the phrase, you know, Biautana, you're not quite in April, you're not quite in May, you're not quite in the day, you're not quite in night, you're between times. So this whole liminality world where kind of anything can happen you can imagine how dark Ireland would have been at that time yeah yeah and then even in your own homes no fire no glow of your fire and then all of a sudden you see the lights rising in the distance on the different hills like how spectacular and how spiritual that would have felt that's amazing and that's like we don't experience anything like that anymore no not I don't think there's anything that could compare to that you know you're watching your your nearest focal point of wherever hill and you're talking miles between hills not just like down the road and I think how what that would have looked from a bird's eye view to just see the fires pocketing up over the country would have been absolutely beautiful yeah but then what happened after that was uh, the hill of Ishnok just became a huge big festival there would be singing there would be dancing people would come and would um bring gifts there would be markets it again became a very glorious day of welcoming in summer being together with your neighbors after the winter again and it just sounds like such a really positive festival and it's something i think we need to bring back we need to have the may day festival in I, communities more like i would love that because that was the whole point it's something beautiful about that kind of everybody extinguishing their own fire yeah to then go to a big communal fire that's for all of you you know there's something so lovely about that and we don't do anything like this anymore bonfires are associated with like you know teenagers lighting a a nasty grizzly plastic fire in the middle of a field and rumors of you know poor cats being thrown in them or something on halloween like that's terrible and that's the the time that people do bonfires instead of this what beautiful bonfires thing. do you be going to jenny that's the bonfires i'd be hearing about my whole life i just roast marshmallows over mine well that's good for you but in dublin apparently they don't do that that's what i was told about all the time to avoid halloween and bonfires because people throw cats into them which is atrocious this is so upsetting and it's probably maybe <sighs> like why we can't celebrate these things nowadays is because like the the respect is not there you know what i mean the same fear that we would have had for maybe messing up the ritual is not there anymore so it's kind of just becomes a big oh let's all have a big session and get drunk and light a fire because that's a great idea no no alcohol and fire no there's something about that kind of um deep sense of connection to like the earth and something bigger than us and that community is just gone and that's what would happen on Ishnok then this giant national <laughs> bonfire would be lit there because that's such a spiritual significance yep and this still happens today this does still happen today and unfortunately obviously it's been cancelled for this year but that does not mean that you can celebrate your own way of coming into Biata. I I'm even thinking I might even get up before dawn and yeah, just kind of acknowledge the sunrise, the first sunrise of summer. That will be lovely. Wouldn't it? Just, yeah. You know, have a cup of tea and watch the sunrise. If it's not raining, if it's not said to be cloudy, I might do that. I mean, sure, look, we're up nearly at sunrise, like. 
obviously because this is a very spiritual time and there's all this connection with the fairies there is a huge amount of um good luck and bad luck associated with um practices that were t that took place on may day on biasana and we want to tell you about them so that maybe you can take part in some of these practices yourself or you'll know what to avoid doing on biasana or during the month of may we knew there was one location where you would have all of this all of this research for about May Day, and that is the, the school's collection. Now, to tell you a little bit about the school's collection. In 1937, the Irish Free State undertook an initiative to record as many folklore, oral history, um, games, pastimes, crafts um, about Ireland, because they felt that Ireland was, in 1937, becoming too modern, and that we were losing touch with our heritage and they didn't want the old folk to, to die out and none of this knowledge and tradition to be passed down to younger people. So they got primary schools involved in 26 counties and fifth and sixth year students took about recording details of their games, their trades, their crafts, their histories, their ghost stories, anything that was considered oral culture. And they went and asked their families, they asked their grandparents, they asked their neighbours, and there is over 740,000 pages of records. Wow. Most of these are written on the original copybook papers, which is lovely. It's an invaluable source, I think we have. So and I just wish we did something like that now. I wish we did, uh, yeah. But so much of it is died out now, which is really sad when you go back to it. Because in 1937, you know, there were still things being practiced. And that's not that long ago. That's less than 100 years ago. And it's that's really upsetting. But you can find most of this on ducus.ie. And if you want to go on it, you can probably type in, you can type in your own locality name. So your own families. If you know that one of your family members back in 1937 was in fifth or sixth class in the country, they probably took part in this initiative. And there is probably written records that they have in the archives from when they were children, which is really lovely if you want to access them. They're free to access. If you want to type in your um, parish name, there will be records about your history of your parish, which again is lovely to find out the ghost stories, the folklore, the medicines that people were writing down and you're probably living in the house of maybe some of these stories that were taking place. So definitely check out the resource, ducas.ie. This is where we found a lot of our May Day traditions. And um, we went on to it, children were recording the traditions from their grandparents, from their neighbours. And these were some practices that they had. So we're going to read you a few samples that we took from the collection. These are in the children's own words. Um, we will tell you who the children were, where they were from, which parts of Ireland. There are so many accounts. We only took four accounts. But please um, listen to them carefully because you never know what you could be doing on May Day that might bring you bad luck or good luck. So our first account is from Bridget Luby. It is recorded in the parish of Gary Doulis in County Limerick. And she got her records from John O'Connor, who was 75 at the time in 1937. She wrote, There are many strange customs connected with Balthain, May Eve. The ancient May Eve customs are now dying away. Long ago, the young children, especially girls, used to go round the house to dress in beautiful flowers. These youngsters used to sing a song at each house and, give a, and get a few pence in exchange. In former times, May Eve was regarded as a great festival. The following were the principal customs connected with May Eve in ancient times. First, sweep the threshold clean, sprinkle ashes over it and watch for the first footprints. If they are turned inwards, it means a marriage. And if they are turned outwards, it means a death. Secondly, May Eve, pick, pick up the ashes and put them on a plate. Sprinkle with flour and at sunset, you should see the initials of your true love's name. Thirdly, light a bush before the house on May Eve, and it is considered to keep away thunder and lightning. Another old custom was to go out May Eve and gather armful of yellow flowers, known as May flowers. These are strewn at the gate of every field outside the doors of homes and outhouses, and even on the housetops. It is considered that they would keep away ill luck, evil spirits, and disease. Mm, wow. Nothing about fairies there, though, but it's very... 
Well, ill luck, evil spirits, disease are kind of associated. And also yellow flowers are something that we are told the fairies do not like. Yellow. I don't know why, but yellow and fairies do do not make a pair. That's interesting. Isn't it? So Because when I, I was talking to Sarah about yellow flowers kind of in in kind of more in witchcraft and pagan traditions and in Wicca obviously you as a as a custom you would go out and collect yellow flowers because they're you know they're symbolic of fire because it's a fire festival um but there's no mention ever of warding away fairies or anything like that but obviously there's that same if both you know traditions are telling you yellow flowers now i know yellow flowers are in bloom you have primrose you have daffodils are still up in places you have gorse you have buttercups yep you have a lot of yellow around this time of the year and then the next entry is from a 13 year old elizabeth roach and um she was from county wexford she collected it from a 46 year old gentleman patrick roach so and she noted that on may morning it is said people used to get up early before sunrise and wash their faces in the dew this is supposed to give them a good complexion for the year. Another is whoever could get the first bucket of water from the well would have the luck of the year in butter and eggs. If the milk is not skimmed on May Eve, a charm can take the cream from the milk for the year. On May Day, uh, some people around our locality consider it most unlikely to whitewash or paper their homes on May Day, or during the month of May, as they believe it brings sickness and misfortune to the family. And if they have any if they have any suck work in progress, it is discontinued if there is no possibility of finishing it before the month of May. They also consider it a very bad sign for the fire to go out on May Day, or to meet a red-haired woman on that morning. I remember my Nana saying to me about... Um... She had a relative. It was supposed to be bad luck if you met a red-haired woman before going on a boat. And there was one morning she went out to go to England or something on a boat to visit a relative. And she met a red-haired woman and was like, nope, nope, I'm not going. So, like, people, poor gingers. Oh, seriously, like, always getting... Stick, just for having the colour that their hair was. It's funny, it's again, before sunrise to go out and, and then the dew on their faces... I might do that. I might go out and put the if put the dew on my face. Do there's uh, yeah, like I found accounts where people collected it to wash in it, or maidens were rolling around in it. Yeah, but you know, there's there's an idea. Roll around in the dew, please. That's that's bansa pjaltina. Bansa pjaltina, but don't get a kidney infection. So our next account is from Moira the Alchi, is from Ballyristine in County Waterford. The fairies used to steal butter uh, from the farmers on May Eve. The farmers put cinder under the churns to frighten the fairies away. If they stole it on the 1st of May, they would steal it for the year. The farmers used to get up early and go to a well in their farm for a bucket of water to sprinkle on their crops. A week before May Eve, people used to put a pot of water out and late on May Eve, they would take it in and it would keep coals away for the year. On May Eve, people sprinkle Easter water on crops and around the house so everything would be all right for the year. Mm, that's nice. It's funny, isn't it? Because, like, again, we'd take holy water, Easter water, sprinkle it on the crops. There's your Catholicism. But <laughs> then at the same time, you're putting cinders under the churns to frighten the fairies away. So there's your paganism. Yeah. It's so just that's how Irish traditions work is this blurring of paganism and Catholicism. We didn't strictly follow either, and I think that's that's nice. I think it's nice that they can coexist, or they did coexist for such a long time, and just it's more like a superstition that ran ran the game, really. Yeah, and I don't know. It's just interesting. Yeah, you don't you don't see this often where religion and superstition kind of yeah that they coexist. Very often, one banishes the other. So the fact that there was um, a minglement of both. Both surviving. It was nice. Yeah, it's pretty nice. And our last account comes from from Mary Kay Diffley from Achnagaran, County Longford, uh, taken from Miss Lizzie Brady, who was 66. And she said, 
that on May Eve, the children put up a May bush in honor of Our Blessed Lady. I assume that's Mary. Mm -hmm. This is the way that a May bush is made. The children gather primroses and cowslips and a lot of other flowers and tie them in little bunches on the white thorn bush and put it standing in front of the house on the dung hill. Some people hang it on the door and others put it standing upright in the hedge in front of the house. So there were your accounts from the school's collection. Again, go have a research on them yourself. If they're in, the fact that we have this resource there um, is brilliant. It's free and you can find out so much about your own family or your own locality on it or just even about one of the, uh, our own traditions or heritage or folklore or anything like that. So there is some bad luck associated around the month of May and May Day and I'm going to tell you about them so that you can avoid doing them to avoid any more bad luck coming your way. I'm pissing so, off the fairies. So it was considered bad luck to dig, bathe, whitewash or sail on May Day. Hmm. And by whitewash, you mean like painting the, the like the walls of a house white. Okay. So anyone that's doing a bit of DIY at the moment because of the quarantine, stop. stop. Take it off. No, it's unlucky to dust on May Day. So there you go. Just do a bit of sweeping. Yeah, so you don't have to dust. Fantastic. And to get married in May, it was considered unlucky. Are you serious? Uh, apparently so. The because whole month of May. That's mad because when it comes to like pagan or witchcraft or wicca traditions yeah. hand fasting always happens in may a lot of um you know it's the month of fertility for yeah. witches and things like that for witches and pagans it's a month of fertility and joy so it's the perfect time to tie the knot get married you know make those babies because it's the month of fertility and that's really interesting how it contradicts the folklore you know like the, that like, part of the folklore this is there's all these contradictions but every part of ireland had its own way of practicing may and every part of ireland had like its its own traditions that country contradicted with another like in some parts of ireland you know you you felt okay bringing the hawthorn in on the first day of may whereas in other parts yeah. in ireland you wouldn't bring the hawthorn in on the first day of may you just full stop wouldn't do it so there's a lot of like the same thing, but just slight variations. Um, it is mad. And this is a very grim one. If you didn't hear a cuckoo for the whole month of May, it meant death. Oh dear. So. But what if there's no cuckoos in your area? Then I think, then you have a, a free pass. Okay, okay. Because I, I don't know if I've ever heard one, honestly. Like cuckoo. I don't think so. Not here. They're nasty little birds. They knock other birds' eggs out of the nests and raise their own kids. That's terrible. Bad birds. Um, it was unlucky to give away salt, water, or fire. It was considered if you gave away any of these um, items that the profits of your farm or your household would go with it. So if you were to ask for, like, a smoke, it was considered bad luck. Um, if you were to ask for, like, a drink was considered bad luck and if you were to ask for salt for like food preservation or anything bad luck in fact looking to borrow anything on may day is considered suspicious um people would treat you differently again because it was like you were looking to pass away something the the main concern was that the fairies would come in and steal your milk and steal your butter take away your livelihood from your farm but it was also possible for a person to steal your milk and butter. This did not physically mean that you ran in and like, you know, took the milk out or like, That's you know. That's what I think though. Someone runs past your window, grabs your stick of butter. <laughs> I know, yeah. yeah, I have it. It would mean like everything would go bad on you. Butter in the churns would go bad. Nothing, your cows would be dry all year. Your cows wouldn't be able to give birth to be able to suckle, to be able to make milk. Um, it would just go all down the drain. But how you stole someone's butter was you would go to go through briars three times saying, all the butter come to me, all the butter come to me, all the butter come to me. And that gave you the power to steal someone else's butter. I don't know whether the briars had to like cut your legs or whether they, you could go in just fully clothed into them. I don't know. 
that was apparently how you could do it. But you, if you had yellow flowers up in your house, it would stop your neighbours from being able to steal your butter. Okay. And my butter, you think it is just kind of your assets, your livelihood, or just anything that kind of... I think so. I think so. Particularly, like, obviously butter in itself. Yeah, I think so. Anything to do with your cattle. Anything to do with that. Now, having said that, like, if I could walk through Briars and say this, and all the butter out of super value and, like, Tesco comes to me, like... That's great. Can I pick and choose? Can I get dairy gold? Can I get, like... I think so. As long as you specify it three times, I'd say three so. Three times. So I'll go through. I wonder can I, if I apply to, like, if I say chocolate three times or something. That would be, that's what I'd be wondering. Yeah, like, snacks. That's what I want. And then what do you do? It just arrives one day, just starts opening presses, and just starts flowing out into the floor. That's the you dream, know? Sarah. That's the dream. So much butter. Oh, so oh, much snacks. But like a perfect buttery toast. Like there's sometimes nothing, oh, better, nothing better. Or like a perfect. There's nothing butter. <laughs> perfect butter biscuit. You know, like to um. What are they? Rich, rich tea? tea. Oh, Jenny, they're so good. <laughs> just dip it in the tea, and then just eat it. Oh. oh my god, I've never done a buttery rich tea. Now I, I, I'll tell you that. What? It's so glorious. Like my eyes are watering thinking about it. It's so good. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, I mean, that's the power of butter, isn't it? I know what you'll be doing on me first. Butter, butter everywhere. Butter, butter everywhere. And not a drop to steal. Oh, dear. Because you got to purchase it. Like a good citizen. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> we don't encourage you to steal butter. No. That's disclaimer. No, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, exactly. But we want to tell you how you can celebrate May Day yourself. If you're stuck at home, quarantined and bored and you're looking for something to pass the time and maybe get back in touch with some kind of older connections, older roots, Jenny is going to tell you some customs that you can take part in. Absolutely. I have a list of things that I'm going to suggest that we could all do or try. But the first one should probably be you could make a Maybush because that's a very traditionally Irish thing. Um, typically it was, well, so, yeah, it's a very uh, popular Irish custom until the late 19th century. And usually that was a small tree or branch, typically hawthorn, uh, which we know is a witch's or fairy tree. So it's the only day that you're allowed to cut one down and bring into the house, if you so wish. Um, so it can be hawthorn, rowan, holly, or sycamore. And you decorate this branch um, with either bright flowers, ribbons, sometimes people used painted shells, things like that. Um, and that's, and then you bring that into your home or you plant it outside or I don't know, parade the streets, whatever you so wish to do. Yeah, that sounds, painted eggshells was another big thing. Painted I've, eggshells, yeah. I've read so many accounts of people painting eggshells, which is really strange because it's like the one thing everyone will have on their Maybush is ribbons and eggshells that's very true yeah because that's something you have in the house all the time and i don't know i'm reading into like you know eggs are a symbol of fertility and this is the time for that that's a good point i would have said it was because of poverty and like you know <laughs> but in a sense of like you didn't have fancy baubles but you had circular eggshells you had eggshells and you had sh like shells if you lived near the coast yeah you had seashells yeah yeah, yeah. You use what you have. Yeah. That's what people always did, which I thought was really lovely. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can you can make a maybush or maybe a variation of a maypole, which is very... This is, again, as we mentioned earlier in the, in the episode, the maypole is the very typical May Day celebration kind of image that comes to mind. So usually it's a large, long pole. Uh, with long colourful ribbons attached to it and people would kind of gather and uh, dance around it kind of slowly intertwining the ribbons and covering the pole in this beautiful arrangement of ribbons themselves. So but it is a very European thing rather than an Irish thing. Than an Irish thing, yeah. Um, but you could make a mini one if you so wished, if that was what was intriguing you. You know, people, mm -hmm. maybe you want to make a smaller version for your garden or if you have space or maybe make a tiny just tiny version of it for yourself mm -hmm. you know 
people um, sometimes bake things, things in Scotland. It's known to bake bannocks or oat cakes. Um, and I mean, I found some recipes for this, which we could share on our social media. Oh yeah. So it's just, a, it's an oat cake that people would make. So it's very popular to bake goods like breads and oat cookies and just oat cakes. So anything like that, you can get baking. Um, also, you can make something called coddle, which is a traditional drink made of like milk, oatmeal, eggs, honey, nutmeg and whiskey or ale. So and I will share a recipe for that on our social media as well. Oh, very nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, the biggest tradition is to go out and collect some yellow flowers like daisies, dandelions, honeysuckle, buttercups, um, anything yellow that you can find to bring into your home, decorate your, your room, your living space, your kitchen, your door, um, your, your outside, basically. I read accounts where people would decorate their neighbors' land and fences with yellow flowers, things like that. Yeah, it's lovely. See, sense of community again. Yeah, that would be nice actually go along, just put a little flower on everyone's gate. But it is because the protection against fairies, evil spirits were said to be very active. So you were warning off. It's a bit like the lamb's blood across the door, you know. It's The, the, the yellow flowers is less harmful. and uh, <laughs> Less scary. Yeah, and it's nice, I think. So um, next on my extensive list is to create a Bialtana or May altar, if that is something that pleases you. An altar is just a kind of structure that you put offerings or anything kind of ceremonial or symbolic on, which, you know, you can do whether you're religious or not. It's just like a little, just like a shrine, basically, to, to the first day of summer and this kind of time. And people usually put things from... Uh, offerings from nature like acorns, flowers, the yellow flowers that you collected, um, shells, crystals like rose quartz, candles to symbolize fire because if you can't, if you don't have the space to have a bonfire, you of course can just light candles. And basically yeah, you use elements of fire, uh, the colors of spring like greens, pinks, blues, yellows, and decorate it with um, apples and woods and incense and things like that and you'll have yourself a Bialt on the altar. So basically do anything that revolves around fire. If you have the space, again, you light a bonfire or two campfires or two bonfires and you dance between them, you jump over them, you have feasts and you sing because that's what the ancestors would have done. You know, if like you so can. I like that too. I wish I could do that. I definitely don't have the space for that, unfortunately. But um, if not, and if you can't have any kind of bonfires or campfires, light two candles, especially if you have maybe two big pillar candles, and just like have your meals that day on May Day. Because it's a day of um, like love and fertility and joy. Let the people in your life know how much you love them. Maybe do something nice for somebody, like write somebody you love a poem or a letter, or do something nice that's unexpected or maybe a random act of kindness or something like that to kind of spread joy, to kind of be this, um, if you can't light the fire, be the beacon of fire. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, and because, yeah, it's a day of joy and kind of love, don't forget to give yourself some self-love. So, especially if you're by yourself, take this day to celebrate and love yourself uh, do all the things that you love that make you happy. Eat your favorite food, watch your favorite movies, listen to your favorite music, uh, light these candles and just have yourself a lovely uh, summery day of celebration if you can. This is a day to review your commitments and projects and promises, uh, maybe start on creative projects or anything like that. And eat summer berries like blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, cherries, maybe bake a pie or a cake with them or something like that and laugh and dance a lot because that's the day for it. Again, like the ancestors would have. That's nice. It's like the ghosts of your ancestors in the room with you dancing and laughing. Like, I think that's beautiful. Mm, I think that's really lovely. So if you can, do, do dance. Do, do a big dance. 
Um, there's so many online dance classes happening right now, if, if that's your thing. Um, or just wake up, maybe start your morning by turning on a song that really makes you feel happy and just have a little, have a groove, you yeah. know? Have a head bop around the kitchen. That's all a bunch of stuff that you could actually do on May Day on the 1st of May. That's good. Um, what, is there any traditions you are going to follow through on May Day with Jenny? Is there anything you're going to go try and do? Yeah, I mean, I would love to, you know, go to sleep at a decent hour to wake up to watch the sunrise. I haven't done that in a very long time and it sounds really beautiful and lovely. Like if I manage to do that, I'm going to make a cup of green tea and go and watch the sunrise. Mm -hmm. And if not, I will have a nice line, (laughs) then make a cup of tea. And then I'm going to go on a walk and collect some yellow flowers. Um, I would like to do that myself. Like I might go sit by a tree, have a little, have a little think, our meditation by the tree and mm-hmm. um, bring the yellow flowers back into the house and I might use the day to do something creative because I mean as creative people that's where my mind's gonna go and um, mm-hmm. so because it's a day for like you know planning projects or uh, making kind of new promises to yourself or something like that I might make a list of stuff I want to do or yeah I know you're a fan of lists so yeah, maybe make a list of things I want to do in the near future or while I'm in quarantine still. Um, and maybe, like, I would like to bake something oaty. Oh, sounds delicious. That would be nice. I really like oats. <laughs> I'm a horse. Yeah, I think I'm going to go... We have a... We call it our fairy tree down the bottom of our garden. It's a hawthorn that's growing out of an old stone boundary wall. Um, I'll probably go down and put some ribbons on it put some eggshells on it i'm not going to cut it just no. it's my own preference i won't cut that tree and i certainly won't be bringing any hawthorn into my house just you know don't need no more bad luck no um it's your haunted house you know oh god no uh but i will go around and find some yellow flowers put them down i might do that thing if i'm up early enough and i watch the sunrise i'm going to get the, the the dew and wipe it on my face and have no wrinkles like get a little cloth or just dab some dew on your on your fresh morning face after the sun has risen like that just sounds so glorious to me on that note i want to give a big shout out to the wexford maybush festival and um, this is a festival that they've been trying to keep the maybush tradition alive and i have to say when i stumbled across it on social media um, i was really taken aback by the response that this festival has received so it was first began um, by Michael Fortune, who is a folklorist, and Aileen Lambert, who is a traditional singer and artist. They began restoring the tradition when they realised in around 2002 that the Maybush tradition, the creation of it, was dying out. So they set about establishing a huge online presence to bring it back. And it did, through social media, the power of social media, and going out and recording people in their locality and talking about their own Maybush traditions that they had growing up, they managed to bring um, they managed to bring its practice really back into Wexford because Wexford has one of the strongest documented accounts of the Maybush tradition in practice. And this is really lovely because the Maybush planting scheme is supported by the Environment Department of Wexford County Council and they gifted hundreds of hawthorns to different groups, schools and individuals on the condition that they raise the plant and um, treat it as a maybush when the year comes around. So this, the article that I read was in February of 2020. So I hope it was just a few weeks before our lockdown. So I hope to everyone in Wexford listening and to the Wexford Maybush Festival that you got to do this. But at that time, they were working on bringing 400 young hawthorn trees all around Wexford, again, to be looked after and decorated when the Maybush time came around and to keep them growing so that they would be there for the next century and the next century. Aww. Isn't that lovely? And at that time, they had 25 volunteered, uh, voluntary groups and communities working together to make this happen. So again, it was bringing the community back into the, the creation of it. And they're, I mean... As far as I could see, they were going to have like huge big festivals. The towns were going to get together, have their May bush, maybe elect a May queen that would dance around the bush. And it was going to be lovely. And obviously it's not happening this year, but they are having a virtual May bush dance. Oh, 
Yep, I found that today, and I was like, you know what? It's a there's a first for everything. So if Absolutely. we can't be together in person, then let's be together online. So if anyone wants to check them out in social media, um, this is all happening on the first of May down in Wexford, but they are having a huge online presence, and we definitely recommend checking them out because I think it's brilliant that, um, they're keeping these traditions alive. Absolutely, it always is when someone because it always brings together like the community again to like collect this like oral tradition or folklore or you know to come together to fight to make something happen and you know it's, it's really lovely so that's pretty cool that that is still happening up in Wexford yeah and quite proudly you know like yeah I get the impression that it's not all just like isolated little pockets of like older people that do it it's very much you know throughout the ages and I think that's great I think it's great and I think we need to do more of that so get out and decorate your May bushes on May the 1st. Seriously, yeah. Or just a bush, or just a tree. Yeah, hang some ribbons. Yeah, make some wishes, hang some ribbons. We'll manage to do something small for May Day, or be out to the, however big or small, and whatever appeals to you. You know, and even though we're apart, we'll be together in this sense. Have the bounce. Have the bounce on Bialtana. And if you're listening later into the month of May, you can still have the bants. Like, you can erect a May bush at any time in May. I mean, it's supposed to stay up for the whole... Well, some people keep it up for one day and then they burn it. And then some people keep it up for the whole a month That's of May. Right. Yeah. So, whatever. And if you're listening to this in August or September, heck, make your own bush for the month. Why not? Why not? Thank you so much to everybody who has listened and stayed with us. Thank you to everybody who has reached out on social media. We are very thankful for your engagement and your appreciation of what we do so far. So thank you. Yeah, very much so. We appreciate the time that you take to write to us. We value every story that you share with us, every photograph, every little message. Heck, you know, we, we've we got a lot of time in our hands. We'll reply to everything. And um, happily so, yeah. yeah. So please keep sharing. Please uh, take part in our hashtag fairy tree challenge. Just send us pictures of fairy trees if you can and you have them because, as we said, it's amazing to see these beautiful pictures and these beautiful trees. And maybe if we do get enough, we will be able to take them to the folklore department. Please do send us in stories or tales or paranormal experiences that you want to share with us or stories about the fairies. Or if you want to tell us what you're going to do on May Day, please do. I would love to hear that. And please, if you do do anything on May Day that is inspired by us, please tag us. Please tag us and send us a picture. We'd love to see. Love that. So, from two banshees to you, we bid you a farewell and a big, juicy thank you for listening to us. Happy Bialtana. Happy Bialtana. <laughs>